All right. Hi, Marianne. Thanks for doing this with me today. Hi, Scott. This is going to be fun. <laughs> so just to introduce ourselves, everyone, I'm Scott Kilpatrick. I'm the head of the Department of Economics, and my colleague Marianne Wanamaker is a faculty member in our department and also served on the White House Council of Economic Advisors in 17 to 18, finishing as chief domestic economist in the White House. Um, so you're more the policy expert here, but I thought it might be um, good for our students and maybe others to just have a chance to sort of hear how the kind of conversations that people like you and I are having uh, about how the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting the economy and the things that we're thinking about longer term as the economy starts to recover. So that's, that's kind of the, the plan for today. Sounds good. All right. So we're talking on the, the afternoon of Friday, April 17th, which is we seem to be at a point where um, maybe we're at the end of the beginning, where the, the initial surge of um, the pandemic outbreak appears to be largely contained and the trends are starting to go in a better direction, even as mortality is still high. Um, and there's, there's a lot of discussion now about reopening the economy. Um, so let me just start off by asking you, what do you think that looks like? What do, you, what do you think the process of reopening the economy looks like in broad strokes? And what kind of policy is needed to support that? Uh, good question. I mean, I'm a little bit surprised at how quickly this is evolving. I mean, I just saw before this conversation that Texas is putting forward guidance about reopening next week. Um, I would have anticipated that most places would have wanted a robust testing system in place before they really started to reopen. So my guess is that in these early days, and I'm curious to hear what you have to say, but I think in these early days, the reopening is actually going to be guided by people's behavior more than government regulation. And that people are going to say, yeah, I see that you said we're open, <laughs> but I, I don't assess that the risk of my getting sick has fallen at all. And I don't see any change in the therapeutic options, and I don't see any change in the probability of dying from this thing. And so I, I hear you that we're open, but I'm not leaving my house. Is that your sense? That is very much how I'm thinking about it. And, and along with that, to sort of go, you know, I think a lot of people are thinking about the, the economic shutdown as a mandated shutdown. And maybe in the beginning it was, if those mandated mandates had, hadn't come at exactly the time they did, people were still going about their business. But as we come out of it, I think the constraint on economic activity, exactly as you say, is going to be less the mandates at some point. It will get to a place where it's less the mandates and more people's willingness to go back to school, back to work, back to whatever, ultimately larger scale events like sporting events and stuff like that, but even restaurants and so on. And that gets into the question of the credibility of this, right? So if we have some type of opening, as you're talking about, where when we don't have wide scale test and trace in place, and we don't have, you know, those kinds of procedures to identify quickly any new outbreaks that occur, then something, then those are bound to occur. And when they do, they're going to scare people back into their homes, right? Yeah, I think, I think it's been interesting, like people seem to be really frustrated by the restrictions. And yet, if you ask Americans, like, is, name a particular industry or occupation that you think ought to be able to go back and that is currently not allowed, they can't name one. Yeah. Right? I mean, all of our critical, all critical operations are still running. Um, and so it's really hard to name what's the thing that government is holding down that they shouldn't be. And I don't see it. Um, so I think you're right. I think people are, you know, we, we may start to slowly get complacent and slowly reemerge. And then as soon as there's a second wave of this thing, we're all going to retrench right back to where we were without this, again, without this kind of testing, you know, testing infrastructure in place. Right. And we're, you know, we're starting to see in other countries a little bit of reopening. Some countries are a little bit ahead of us. And it goes to some of this, like as Denmark has reopened this week, I think K through five education, there's been a lot of pushback from families saying, I'm not ready to have my kids go back to school. Yeah. And the government very quickly had to adjust, as I imagine we will here, to say, you know, K-12 education is traditionally compulsory, but in this new environment, <laughs> can it be compulsory? Do we want it to be, right? I mean, if we're in a world in which the virus is still um, you know, a threat for an outbreak, 
um, then we probably want to be in a world in which the moment a kid has a sore throat or a cough, they get tested and until then they don't go back to school. And maybe even if they do test negative, if there's a concern, they stay home. Or maybe even if a friend has an illness and they're worried about it, they stay home, right? We don't wanna be pushing people back to socializing when they're not ready. If anything, we probably want to be sending the message, stay home if you have any concern at all. Right. Yeah, and I think I think they, these have in, that same story has a really interesting higher ed implication. Like when we do open, will we make attendance compulsory? How are how are you and I going to manage the attendance expectations for our classes? Yeah, um, not even just in the fall, like going forward. I think this is kind of a longer run issue. Can can I just highlight in what you just said, and I, I hope we're going to talk about this how valuable it is to Americans that Europe has gone through this first. Yeah. I just think it would be a total, we'd be in a totally different situation if we didn't have those models in front of us. Do you think, do you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's that. And we all learn from each other in this process. And one of the things that I think that as of right now, European countries seem to be doing a little bit better that I think is going to be crucial, right, is if ultimately getting back to normalcy is about people believing they're safe to get back to their normal activities, What's key really is not lifting the, cons the mandates to stay home so much as providing credible information to convince people that it is safe. And I think, you know, as I was thinking about this, I think it's a, a little bit, you know, there's a, a, a weird analog to uh, the Federal Reserve and economic policy, right? If you think about what the Fed does, it tries very hard to be predictable. It makes very transparent what data they track and to a large extent, how they're going to be looking at that data, what types of changes in the data they may see would drive a policy change. I think, uh, you know, in a perfect world, there's going to be a lot of local and state level discretion. There are going to be a million small decisions to be made, but you'd have a framework starting from the federal level, from the CDC or something saying, here's the data that we're tracking. Here's what, here are the conditions under which we think we can start to, you know, the the White House proposal was a phased return to normal activity, phase one, two, three, which is a kind of framework that makes sense. But giving a lot more granularity to that, to here's what those phases look like, here's what kinds of testing and tracing needs to be happening in order for this to work, here's what the data we need to see, and here's what's going to happen when we see something that indicates there might be an outbreak and how we might retrench, right? Because we could be in a situation where at the level of individual employers, individual schools, um, you know, there are little outbreaks which can be contained and probably don't mean that we need to go back into a full lockdown, but people need to have the confidence that everybody who was in contact with that outbreak is being isolated, right? So all of that and having systems in place to give people the confidence that, that those that all of that activity is being is being tracked seems to me to be the real the real work of policy right now. When you when you were saying that about you know uh, about the Federal Reserve, I thought you I thought you were going to go a different direction, which is I thought you were going to tell me, tell me that this was the real advantage of kind of federalism even in <laughs> Europe, right? That like that if all of Europe has the same policies, then you don't get this experimentation from which America can learn, right? right? And so the fact that all of Europe has a different policy, a different policy in every country is actually super helpful for us, right? Yeah. I mean, we, because you, because the UK deviated from the rest of Europe in their initial response, we all learned something super valuable. And I think we'll learn something valuable from what Germany's doing relative to France and Italy. And then, as you said, Denmark, um, I'm, I'm really grateful for their disintegration at the moment. <laughs> um, and I think the same thing will be true in the US. I mean, we won't just, you know, no matter what the guidance is out of CDC, and I'm hoping for more coherent guidance going forward. But whatever the guidance is, we're, everybody's going to do it a little bit differently. Right. And hopefully there's enough data and, you know, and really, I think that the role of social science here is going to be to take that information and try to parse, okay, what about this outcome was policy driven and what is just kind of a random, this is a random flare up versus this is something that happened because you implemented this policy and therefore we should not implement this policy again, right? right. So I think that's where economists can be super helpful is that we're good at those sorts of modeling exercises, empirical exercises, 
all you students who are listening, like this is the point of econometrics yeah. is to discern what of this is really causal and what of this is just a correlation. Yeah, we're going to be studying data from this era as a natural experiment for decades, probably. We are. And I don't, you know, I think there's a whole lot of evidence that like, you're not going to be able to use COVID-19 as an experiment in what happens when students go home for three months and don't go to school, right? Like, it's not a great it's not a great experiment for that because there's a whole bunch of other stuff going on besides just not going to school. Right. right, right. But it will be useful in thinking about some of these bigger, like, you know, how do you respond to a pandemic successfully? Um, and economists are going to have a huge role to play in that, I think. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. On the, on the sort of state local uh, decision-making side, you know, right now, I think there are a lot of policymakers. It depends on the, the locality, obviously, but there are, there are places where, governors and local officials are feeling a lot of pressure to uh, to take some of the mandate mandatory shutdowns to back off on that but you can see this going the other way too at some point a lot of local decision local officials are going to be making decisions about reopening schools and universities and so on allowing restaurants to reopen and that sort of thing in which there's going to be pressure on one side but there's also going to be a lot of fear of having jumped the gun right that you do reopen and then there's a major outbreak and you know people people say you know that we people lost their lives because you made the wrong decision and that's where i think those you know i know if i were in the unfortunate position of having to make some of those decisions uh i would want you know a, a background coming from the cdc or elsewhere giving me the guidance on here are the criteria you need to look at and here's here's how these decisions should be made so that it gives you a, you know, a basis um, to justify that decision and feel a little bit less out on a limb as you make those decisions. Well, and what's true for policymakers in that dimension is also true for employers. I mean, what employers are really pining for right now is some rule (laughs) that tells them when they can compel their workers to come back to work and when they cannot, because they are exposing themselves. If they don't have that, they're exposing themselves to a huge amount of litigation going forward. Right. So some of the slowness of our recovery will be about consumers but some of it will also be about producers who just don't yet feel comfortable that they're safe from those sorts of lawsuits yeah um so i think that's an that's an ongoing policy discussion in washington actually is should you grant employers immunity from those sorts of lawsuits just in an effort to try to get the economy going again i don't necessarily think that's the right answer but it's it's interesting that that's up for discussion right um, before we talk more about the labor market, let me ask you one thing kind of related to the big picture. So one thing that worries me, and again, this is a little bit thinking relatively to European countries that are maybe ahead of the curve on us, uh, relative to us, is um, basically the, the healthcare situation in the U.S. And, you know, if we get to a place where it's critical that we're trying to encourage everybody at the first sign of any uh, infection or contact with somebody who's infected to get tested. Uh, One thing that worries me is about is whether people will be compliant with that, right? Because if I either have very limited health insurance or worry about losing my health insurance in the future, if I'm a young, healthy person and I just get a little bit of a cough, right? Is it in my interest to go get tested, right? If I'm not suffering serious symptoms myself, or maybe I'm totally asymptomatic, but I know I could be caring because I encountered somebody who was, um, it's, it's essentially a contribution to the public good to go get tested, right? Because I could face some serious negative consequences, especially if, that, if, that, if I'm worried about the medical bills, if I encounter them, if I worry about having then been diagnosed and having a pre-existing condition when I go to get um, insurance in the future if we end up in a place where um, infection with COVID-19 is found to be associated with higher risk of kidney or lung issues in the future, which is possible, right? So it's, it's, it's possible to imagine reasons why people would be gun shy. Should I not be worried about that? Or what do you think? Well, it's an, I hadn't thought, I hadn't thought about this from the perspective of pre, the pre-existing conditions line that if I do this and then I, turn up positive, then going forward, I'm harder to ensure. I mean, at the moment, we still have, imperfect as it is, we do still have an Affordable Care Act system that does not allow insurers to 
to discriminate on the basis of pre-existing conditions. You know, again, not perfect, but it is that is still the law of the land. Um, so I guess I'm less concerned about that particular angle. Um, and I'm I'm glad that we've moved. You know, if you remember at the beginning of this, we what what people were saying was you, the test is covered. If you go if you go to the doctor, the test is covered. And it's like, well, okay, well, what if I go to the doctor and they say, oh, I know you don't have COVID-19, you've got something else. Okay, then am I going to get charged for the visit? Because I thought I had COVID-19, but they knew immediately I didn't. So there's no test, right? So I think we've mostly moved away from that. And now it sounds like most people going forward are going to get tested in the drive-through system, where in, in fact, Knox County, I think, has moved to this point already, which is just like, if you think you have it, come get tested. It's a drive-through process. You don't have to have our approval to get a test. So I think that probably goes a long way towards getting people to do what's in the best interest of the public. Yeah. Um, you know, especially since those tests are free. Like, I really feel like we're, we're really getting there rapidly. I guess I don't share as much concern. Okay. Yeah, good question. And, and remember that like the first person who's going to get infected, right, is people that you know and love. So you do have this incentive to try to limit the spread, well, sure. right? Even if it doesn't affect you, it affects somebody that you like. So, you know, I do think people will respond to that. That's true. That's very true. Um, so let's talk about the labor market a little, a little bit. I know um, you and I have talked about this before, that we both kind of share the worry about how the short run shutdowns impact firms going forward through the labor market and the, what, we're, what we're doing to support um, to support the unemployed and, and firms that shut down. So what's your perspective on how well policy is addressing that right now and um, how this is going to affect the labor market going forward? I mean, I think it's been a pretty imperfect policy, but there, there are some good things. So um, one good thing, I guess, <laughs> right, is that as of maybe Monday, I believe they're going to re they're going to um, reload this PPP program. So the PPP program is the thing that small businesses of fewer than 500 employees have been able to tap into, and that program is is um, generous in the sense that you don't have to show really that you've been you know catastrophically impacted by COVID-19 to take those loans. All you have to say is that these loans are gonna support your ongoing operations, which is pretty straightforward, right? So most American employers of that size are gonna end up tapping that fund. And it ran out of money this week, but it looks like it's gonna be regenerated. So it's generous in the sense that almost every American employer of that size is gonna eventually probably tap into it. Um, so that's good. On the employee side, you know, we've done, we've done these really generous UI benefits, right. which um, now I will say they're generous, but they also are taking a very long time to reach people. And so if you, if you filed for unemployment the week of March 24th, which was really the first major surge in unemployment claims, um, I think in like only five states, are you currently getting a check for that week? So that, and we're almost a month after that, right? So it's a really, really slow process. And in the meantime, what happens to people is that because they have no income, they end up taking, you know, high interest rate loans of some sort. So they either do a payday style loan or they, they pay for things off of their credit card, right. right? And so people make decisions out of necessity that end up having long-term costs. So I think, you know, I, UI is a robust system, meaning we can accommodate, we will eventually be able to accommodate every claim in the U.S. through that system, and it is very generous, but it's imperfect in other ways that will have long term, kind of a long-term hangover. Um, and then we've talked before, and I think this is still the big unknown, is how well will people transition off of UI and back into the labor market when we start to really regenerate economic activity? Um, and a lot of employers have said along the way that their workers were begging to be laid off <laughs> mm -hmm. because the, because again, the UI benefits are so generous. So, um, so I think, you know, transitioning people back to work is going to be a real challenge. And I know the, I know the federal government right now is trying to think about, you know, should the next legislative prep. A package that comes out have some policy in it that starts to push people back. Um, it might be a wage subsidy to go back. It could just be that we're going to cut off the generosity June 30th and then try to push the labor supply back out. Um, it's really going to, I think that's really going to be an interesting transition going forward. Yeah. So, you know, 
when we started going into this, you know, I was thinking about this from the standpoint of, you know, you have this, unlike our most recent recession and our usual recession models, um, this, this isn't coming from a financial shock. It's not coming from, um, you know, monetary policy, a monetary policy spur, uh, tightening, spurring a recession. Um, it's a it's a shock to the real economy, and it's separating a lot of. Uh, it's basically shutting temporarily shutting down a lot of economic activity. But then the question is, how much does that temporary shutdown impact things in the longer term, and how we'll be able to recover from it? Right. And one way it could is if you do have, you know, if ultimately, you know, firms these days are much less a bundle of assets than a bundle of relationships, including internal and external with employees. And if this goes on long enough and you have enough separation from, from between employees and employers, then it may be hard for firms, if we get to the point where we have a vaccine or effective treatment, to kind of quickly turn things back on, right? Um, I think I've, I'm a little bit more optimistic now that the that the length of this uh, shutdown for for most of the economy may not be so long as to cause too much of that kind of damage um, to the economy by you know really impacting the productive capacity of firms by breaking up those networks of employers employees. But we still have a long way to go. Yeah, and I think it's also you know I mean I also think it's just worth worth recognizing that that the growth of the economy relies on, not, not on our stagnant set of relationships, but on the evolution of those relationships. Yeah. And particularly on, I mean, what we call economic dynamism, right? Like we need new firms to enter and old firms to die, right? right? That's part, that's the story. Right. And if you're a graduating senior at UT, you know exactly what I mean, right? You need, you need a new job to open up, right? And the old people to retire. <laughs> that's what you need to have to happen, <laughs> right? And so that you can't just you, know, you can't just say oh let's just freeze this economy right where it is, right? And then be like that's good enough. That's not good enough. You have to have that. You have to have that ongoing dynamism, or otherwise we're gonna. This is a sinking ship. So the what I think what what we're expecting I think is that there will be some firms that don't survive this. Sure. Right. And then I know you said earlier it's not a banking crisis, and it's not. But I can tell you, I talked to a bunch of bankers this morning about this exact thing, and their their phrasing was like, "No way, you are getting a new loan out of me right now. No way, no new capital." Yeah. Right. So if you're an entrepreneur, like this is not your year. Yeah. <laughs> um, for a bunch of different reasons, and if you're a new graduate from college, as much as I want this to to go away quickly, it's not going to. And this is also this is a terrible year to graduate from college. It just is. So. Yes, I mean, you know, yes, even if it's a short run, um, you know, a V-shaped recovery and we recover really quickly, that dynamism, I think is going to take a long time to come back. I think that's going to be, we're going to be next year before we really see the capital start to loosen up and entrepreneurship to come back. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting point because, you know, one of the things, even in a recession like our last, which was very severe and for, you know, it initiated in the financial sector, but you still see in that time that there is there is part of what has to happen or typic and typically does happen in the recession is it's sort of a period in which you know the 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 creative destruction of the economy takes place and firms that aren't really strong don't survive and that creates room for new firms to to spring up and to grow right and one of the things that's that's kind of different about this recession at, at least at this point, right, is it feels like we're, we're less, I think we're legitimately a lot less worried about some of those moral hazard questions, right? As we were very worried about bailing out the auto industry, for example, in the last recession, we did it, but against a lot of opposition. Um, you know, in this recession, I think at least right now, there's a lot more of a sense of, to the extent that firms are being pushed to the wall, it's really not because of bad decisions they've made in the past. This really is a you know, once in a generation, unforeseeable, not totally unforeseeable, but but really unexpected shock. I agree. I was talking to a, a lawmaker in Nashville yesterday, and he made a similar point that like, he didn't want to do this because of the moral hazard, this, this top, this policy we were talking about. Yeah. He said, I don't want to do this. You know, I just like, 
this is moral hazard. I don't want people to get the expectation that this is the way this is going to be forever. And so I said, well, you know, my kids are the same way. Like they're watching an ungodly amount of TV every day, <laughs> but they recognize that this is the only time in their whole life where they're going to get to do this. They, they realize that this is like the one in a hundred year event for them. Yeah. And, you know, I think from a policy perspective, the same thing is true. I think I, I have, I have heard very little talk about moral hazard. In yeah. 2008, that's all we talked about. That's right. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, I think you're totally right about that. Yeah, so let's kind of, you know, play out this, these sort of differences and sort of the macroeconomic effects here a little bit more. So, you know, I, I take your point that, of course, the, the initial shock of the pandemic, which is sort of a shock to the real economy, as a lot of productive resources are shut down um, because of the need to distance. That's the initial shock, and that, that may well spill into secondary financial shocks. I think you know, the Fed and other matters of policy have been doing a fairly good job of trying to head that off, but that doesn't mean that a shock like this won't spill out significantly in that way. So I was trying to think about, you know, what, what does that mean for policy, right? It differently, I mean, one thing that's interesting, right, is in, the, in a recession like our last, it was pretty clear that the financial crisis precipitated a period, not just of negative growth, but where output was well below productive capacity. And even once we returned to growth, it was a long time before we fully returned to whatever you want to call it, the long run real GDP potential, right? Um, one of the things that's, that's different now is it sort of begins with at least the transitory shock to that potential output as many resources are shut down. And then it, it's also a little bit hard to know, especially if this goes on for a long time, if where that long run potential lies, right? If there's really, if there's really an output gap, or if our real economic potential has been negatively impacted by the pandemic in different ways. So, um, you know, as I as I thought about policy in that regard, you know, it's one of the things that I think that we'll kind of see is, do we, you know, we'll know that we're up against our our potential when we start to see inflation. Right, and that's I was hoping a, you were going to say that. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one thing that that I haven't heard much in the discussion. Probably not, unsurprisingly, given that inflation has been for a long time and it remains very, very low at the moment. But you know, that that's really where the conversation about uh, the deficit spending goes to me. Right, when people ask, you know, what's the limit to this? I understand the need for a massive bailout, really a relief package for the economy right now. As you and I have talked about, it's really a relief package, not a stimulus. But what's the limit to that? How much can we spend and how much can we borrow in order to support the economy? And my reaction to that is, we'll, we'll start to see the limits to that if we see it spurring inflation. So. Yeah, I mean, I, look, I, I'm, coming at it, I'm coming at it from a little bit of a different direction, but same conclusion. So I think if you look at what the Fed is doing, mm -hmm. I mean, the Fed, if, if you think about the Fed in 2008, they started at, at home plate, okay? And then they went to first base and then they were like, well, this isn't quite enough. We're gonna do yeah. this new QE things and now we're on second base and people went ballistic, right? They were like, I can't even believe you did that. How are you, how are we at QE, right? So in this, in this event, we, the Fed started on third, okay? Yeah, they skipped right. the first two bases yeah. and they started on third and they started buying assets like crazy. They're intervening in every market. I think at the moment, the only question about the Fed is like, are they gonna buy stocks outright? And the stock market seems to be like steadying itself. So I don't anticipate that they're gonna do that. But the amount of Federal Reserve intervention is off the charts by any metric. And my interpretation of that is that the Fed thinks deflation is our biggest risk mm -hmm. and that they're willing to step in and effectively print money. I mean, I had somebody text me the other day and say, are we, is this, is this modern monetary theory? Like, are we at MMT right now? Aren't they just printing money? And to an extent they are. Yeah. Right. And I think the reason they're doing that and what and the reason that Wall Street is happy for them to do that, for the market to be happy for that, is that they do think deflation is the bigger concern. So if you think deflation is the default, right, that's where we would be if we didn't do anything, then you're cheering fiscal deficits. You're yeah. not scared of them at all. Right. right. You're saying like, oh, my gosh, please spend more. 
Right. Um, and I think for right now, I, I think that's what the market is worried about is that there's downside risk on this, not upside risk. Yeah, it's interesting though, but you know, the flip side of that, and it's not a perfect analog, but if you think back to, you know, the, the one recession sort of in our relatively recent history that was more of a supply shock, it was the 70s oil shocks, right? And uh, those, you know, you know, it's complicated, but they can be interpreted as a negative shock to the real productive capacity of the economy, which spurred a period as we responded to that with the traditional, you know, remedy of mon loose monetary policy and fiscal stimulus spurred a period of high inflation, which then was fairly painful to squeeze out of the economy, right? So it does, it does seem like there's a possibility here that if the effects to the real economy are large enough, and I don't know that they are, uh, but if they are large enough for a long enough period of time, that the, the very aggressive monetary policy combined with very aggressive fiscal policy at some point might start to drive inflation. Now, my perspective on that is, great, we've been in a period in which we've kind of been trapped against very, very low inflation and you know, uh, as this sort of secular stagnation story. There, it, it's not a terrible thing if we pull ourselves to a little bit higher level of inflation if it goes to two, three, even 4% as we pull ourselves out of this. That wouldn't be a terrible outcome. I would much rather see policy being willing to take a little bit of risk on inflation um, rather than being overly worried about uh, the impact of the deficit spending in this environment. So I think what, I mean, I think ultimately that what, what you're saying comes down to, is this a supply shock or a demand shock? Yeah, and it's, it's very both. Hard, and right? which one of those is bigger, right? Yeah. So here, like from the labor market side, this is, this is the way I've been thinking about this. So in the first two weeks of the crisis, the conversation we were having was who can work at home and who can't. Mm -hmm. And the people who can't work at home are the ones who are going to get laid off. And people who can work at home are not. That, do you remember having that conversation? Yeah. Yeah, we had that conversation in the last two weeks, because now it's not a question about supply side. Right now, it's a demand side question. Yeah. I mean, my attorney's sister can work from home, but there may not be any demand for what she does. <laughs> right. And so that's to me, like if you just look at the labor market data, the unemployment insurance applications now more closely mimic the overall population shares in all of these industries. And they don't it doesn't correlate with who can and can't work from home. Okay, so I'm viewing this as we have quickly moved from supply shock to demand shock. Now, as we get back to normal, will the perpetual issue here be a supply side issue or demand side issue? So the way I've been thinking about that is who do I expect to still be unemployed in a year? Mm -hmm. Okay, where do, where do I think we're going to still see weakness? And the people I think are still going to be unemployed in a year are, are demand side issues meaning that people are not gonna fly, they're not gonna travel, they're not gonna go to hotels, they're not going to massive sporting events. It's gonna be demand side stuff. Um, and you know, so I still think the risks are larger on the deflation side, but you know, I could be wrong. I, I will say that I did that this week, um, the University of Tennessee at Martin, so part of the UT system, announced that they were cutting the price for summer school. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the deflation like alarm bells went off in my head of like, okay, this is, this is where, this is what it looks like. Yeah. Right. To have massive deflation. Yeah. And, and gas is $1.25 a gallon where I am. So. Yeah. 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 No, I, I totally agree with you. I think that's the short run. That is much more the risk. Um, what I was getting at is more the question of what are the limits of how much we can borrow to manage the relief effort through this period? Um, and also the Federal Reserve's policy as well, right? What constrains that? Can we just keep financing ever larger, you know, if the pandemic doesn't abate, if we do suffer additional waves and we keep going back to widespread closures and we keep having to, you know, provide support to large share of the population unemployed, um, you know, if that goes on for a long, long time, and those relief efforts are financed by deficit spending, at what point, what ultimately constrains that? Um, and I think that, that that's where we would see that. If we really were, um, you know, if the, the extent of what we can borrow were, were being constrained 
that's where it would start to where we would start to see that as we would be running up against inflation. But I agree that that's that's certainly very unlikely in the short run. Um, and honestly, it's something that would indicate you know a very aggressive policy if it happened in the long run. But it could ultimately. Yeah, the other thing, you you know, when people talk about deficit spending, the other thing that always comes up, it's not just inflation, it's also like at what rate will borrowers have appetite for this, right? So you, you the more you borrow, the more borrowers are going to demand in terms of an interest payment, right? right so the, and, yeah, really but I think that the, the, the good thing about this being a global pandemic, right, is like, like people who are lending you money don't have any great options right now, right? right? Like, like every, every economy is in shambles. So it's not, because it's not a U.S. specific thing, I don't anticipate that the market's going to say, well, I'm only, you know, I'm only going to finance more of this at a higher interest rate. I just, I just don't think we're going to see that. Right. Yet. And the world came into this, you know, some people look at it and say, we came into this with unprecedented high deficits and high debt. But a different way to look at it is we came into it with unprecedentedly low borrowing costs for right. both the right. U.S. government and other governments, right? Yeah. And yeah. they've only Approaching got zero. <laughs> right. And yeah, and they've only gone lower um, through the first stage of this pandemic, which suggests that even as the market sees government borrowing expanding greatly, it sees the supply of, of loanable funds that people want to loan to federal to uh, governments actually increasing even more so. Yeah. And, uh, that doesn't seem to be a, a constraint, at least in the in the near term. I agree. Um, why don't we finish by talking just a little bit uh, about you know, the very long, long-term long question of how the COVID-19 pandemic may affect global supply chains and global economic integration. So we've chatted about this a little bit. You know, you, you hear, unsurprisingly, we hear discussion now of should we be, should we allow ourselves to be in the future um, dependent on, for say, medical supplies on international supply chains? Should we allow ourselves to be so ex as exposed as we are to um, to shocks to world trade from China or elsewhere. Um, so what's your, what's your sort of initial reaction to how this is going to affect, you know, global, the global economy and global economic integration once we're past the pandemic period. So in a, in a scenario in which we, we get to a vaccine or other very effective treatment, the direct effects of the existence of the virus are no longer serious, but the, is there a hangover? Yeah, I, um, so I talked to some of our supply chain faculty about this yesterday, and one of the things they brought up, which I thought was really interesting, is that if you're telling this story about how, you know, not, not, not thinking about healthcare supplies for just a second, so just think about like a, a standard U.S. car manufacturers operations, global supply chain operations, where they have component parts made in Asia and China and wherever else, right? So there, they were, their point was that if, if your story is that people are going to move their supply chains around to avoid China, Okay, so you, for whatever reason, you think China's more susceptible to pandemic or you know, origination going forward. I don't share that view, but suppose you do, right? Right, and then then the idea is like, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna rejigger things so that I can avoid China. Rejiggering things involves a massive amount of capital expenditure at, at exactly the point in your corporate history when you don't have any money to spend on capital expenditures. <laughs> so I think their point was like, if if it's true it'll be a very long term story. It's not something that's going to happen tomorrow. And then the other thing I think, you know, just from that sort of supply chain perspective is this thing's not over. Mm -hmm. Right. And so if your story is like, gosh, China got hammered. And if you had, you know, if you had factories in China, then you were waiting for six weeks for part, you know, before you make a decision about, about undoing your supply chain and moving it around, you want to think about how the, every other country has dealt with the same issue. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a resurgence in Singapore. We're seeing, you know, so it's not obvious that there's some country outside of China that dealt with it better than they did. And it's certainly not obvious that the U S is going to end up being better on this front. Right. Um, so maybe you want to leave China, but it's not clear where you would go. Now, the healthcare supply chain thing, I think, is different. I think that what you're going to see, I think one major thing you're going to see as an outcome of this is I think the U.S. will build a domestic vaccine um, capacity and probably, uh, you know, swabs, whatever else you need to deal with flu pandemic um, uh, respirators. Like, I, I do think that that probably will get built out. I'm not sure what that 
form that takes. I don't know if it's full government ownership or if it's just a government subsidization. I'm not sure how that will work, but I think that'll be one of the first lessons learned is right. like, this is not acceptable. Yeah, it's, it, I agree. I think, you know, on the medical uh, equipment side, right? I mean, it, it's kind of illustrative. The benefits of the global supply chains that we get in terms of lower cost equipment are so great that even there, it doesn't make sense to say, hey, we need to produce this stuff domestically in case there's another crisis. Even there, the right response is we need better preparedness in terms of stockpiling. Stockpiles, equipment. yeah, agreed. And, you know, having plans in place for how scarce equipment is allocated and all of that, right? But the answer is not to shut down global supply chains. It's just to, to deal with the specific concern. Um, but the, you, the other side of this, though, that I do think is, is going to be very interesting to see, right, is that as much as, you know, in your and my lifetime, we sort of have this sense that ever greater global economic integration is almost, you know, fate, right? It's, that's been the direction of the economy for most of our lives. Um, but it can, that can change, right? And there is this wave of nationalism that's, you know, probably most apparent in the European Union where you have Brexit and you have some countries like Hungary tending towards authoritarianism and it's not clear what their future in the EU will be. And it, what it does suggest to me is that it is possible, even at significant economic costs, and I'm using Brexit as the main example of this, for populations to decide, I don't care if it's very costly to retrench. There's something at stake here. I think in Brexit, maybe a sense of national identity that they feel like is being compromised by the, that kind of integration. And even if people are, believe that there will be significant economic costs of retrenching, that doesn't mean it'll never happen, right? There is a scenario in which, you know, much as we did during the Great Depression, we move towards isolationism. I'd like to think the more likely scenario is more what happened after World War II, where we recognize that that it isn't effective in the long term, and the answer isn't isolation, it's integration. It's building the institutional support to go along with the economic integration that's taking place. But it, it could go both ways and probably will go both ways at different places. I think, you know, I, I, one of the things I've been thinking about is how far would it take you on just, just on a pure like spread of pandemic dimension, okay? How far would it take you to undo global supply chains? Mm -hmm. Um, like, is it the physical, is it the movement of physical goods that has made us so susceptible to the pandemic? And my sense is actually that it's not, that it's the movement of people, people. right? And, right. and why do people move? Well, one of the, I mean, some, some travel between the U.S. and China is related to, glo to physical global supply chains. And I understand that. But there's also a, a ton of movement back and forth from China that's related to trade and services. Right. Right, education, yeah, like totally. the, the, the edu higher ed in the US draws a whole bunch of travelers back and forth across the ocean. And so if our retrenchment is just about, well, we're, you know, all the car manufacturers are gonna make, are gonna have domestic component production, that's one thing. But if by retrenchment, you mean that the services trade is also gonna shut down, I don't, there's no way, right? right? And so I've been trying to think like, which of those things is more important? Or if we did shut down the goods trade, what part of the pandemic risk would we be would be avoiding? And I, my sense is not much. Right. Right. Um, and the the sort of retrenchment that would actually protect us is just completely un infeasible. And and even that wouldn't protect us more broadly from the various challenges that a country like China poses, right? So yeah, it doesn't go very far. I, you know, I yeah, as I thought about this, what's striking is that it's in both our interest and I think countries like China to, to build those institutions of trust, right? Part of, you know, part of the story here is that the initial stages of this virus, whatever its origins, weren't immediately clear to the U.S. and the other countries um, as quickly as perhaps they should have been, whatever the reasons for that are, right? The more The more we're exposed, the more that we need to trust that when something like this happens, that we'll, that 
will get inf that information will flow quickly and honestly about it, right? And that's the you know, and I think trade more broadly, all these issues of security, right? They they we will be more one way to one way to address these concerns is to get to a place where we're more comfortable with that that economic interdependence because we have a greater level of trust between our countries, right? We don't worry too much about our economic interdependence with Canada and Mexico, or for that matter, Germany or the UK, because of that level of trust. Um, and to some extent, because we feel like our objectives are more aligned. Right? And you, may disagree, you may disagree with me about that, but I feel like we are a long way from that sort of relationship with China. And no. I've, been, I've been hearing these, these, you know, these statements about, gosh, it takes a pandemic to make us realize how important properly functioning government is. I think that's true. I think that's gonna be one of the long lasting implications of this is that people are gonna appreciate that, you know, you want your public servants to be incredibly competent. But I also think that same argument applies to these kind of international organizations, including the WHO, but not just the WHO, right? Where we've just been kind of blase about their function and whether they're doing, whether they're acting in our best interest, we've kind of ignored them more or less. And I think that's another thing that's going to come back is like, if we're not going to disintegrate from the rest of the world, then these organizations, again, have got to function. There's got to be some yeah. serious competence. And I think the evidence for right now is that they're not functioning very well. Um, so I think that'll be another long-term effect. Uh, I think that's right. Do you, but do you think we'll be spurred to reinvest in those institutions or? I think, I think we are right to demand reform. Yeah. And I've thought that before the pandemic started. So, so when I was at the White, I mean, you know, most of most of what I said today has been informed by that experience at the White House. But really, one of the things that became super clear to me was that many of these kind of multinational organizations are, are not functioning in our best interest. They've been captured in one way or another. Um, WHO is an example. The OECD is another one that, I mean, we are spending a ton of money and it's not clear that the, the goals of that organization line up with the goals of the United States, broadly speaking. So I do think that there will be a revisit of all of those relationships. Um, and I, I think there should be. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay. Well, maybe that's a good place to end this. Thank you so much for doing this with me. It's been fun. It was fun. I hope we'll be in person sometime soon. <laughs> I do too. Thank you. Thanks, Scott.